So, sure. first of all, John, thank you so much for having us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> so, I'm going to suggest people to check out one interview you already did over at Shrink Rap Radio that mm -hmm. you explore a lot your own life and your own personal development. And yep. my suggestion that I already uh, shared with you was for us to talk more about your ideas on expertise in psychotherapy and deliberate practice. Right. And so the first thing I was curious to ask you is, knowing your early background with a father that was a blacksmith, you having underwent musical training, does this early background, did it influence your ideas on what is professional development and professional expertise? Uh, it had a profound impact. Uh, I remember when I was uh, first in supervision, uh, my uh, supervisors found me to be quite puzzling because I'd be wondering, so what should I do here? Uh, what should I say? Uh, look, this patient is suicidal, so how do I address this? What do I need to do? And, and oftentimes, sadly, people were saying things like, well, you need to build a relationship. Um, you need to log more hours. Uh, you have to earn the patient's trust. You just have to be patient. You have to wait. So in, in, instead of being given very practical, technical suggestions about how to help patients, I was given very vague nostrums, right? And, uh, and, and I found this really quite puzzling. And I think supervisors found me quite puzzling because I kept asking for very specific um, advice. And it wasn't forthcoming. <laughs> And I was learning all this theory, and I was reading wildly because I was saying, I've got to find out what to do, you know, how do I help these people? And, um, and then fortunately, I was very lucky because one day a supervisor said to me, John, you worry about too much about technique. You have to remember therapy is an art. Well, at night, uh, I was still a professional horn player as an early therapist, and I was playing extra with the National Symphony. We were doing a Mahler Symphony that night, and it's like – a volcano went off inside me. I realized this, this guy has no idea what art is. You know, it's like people who think art is a bunch of people get together in a park and they've all got a bunch of drums and they're just beating on drums <laughs> and they call it music. You know, I realized they have no clue. Uh -huh. And it was at that moment I thought, I want to learn how to teach psychotherapy as well as my father taught blacksmithing and as well as my music teachers taught music. And, and uh, so that really became my passion. My first book, uh, Psychodynamic Psychotherapy, was like, here's four different ways you can listen to patients and how we analyze material. Because by that point, I was running a psychotherapy, a psycholytic psychotherapy training program, Washington School of Psychiatry. And uh, students were coming out, and they still weren't systematically learning how to interpret transference, and they didn't know how to do defense analysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are like pillars of psychoanalytic technique, okay? I mean, it's, this, is like, this is like learning the alphabet if you're going to write, you know? And, and I just couldn't believe it. And I just thought, you know, there, and I realized there weren't books out there that were very explicit, like, here's how to do transference analysis. Here's how to do defense analysis. Now, whether you do psychoanalysis or not, those are really very useful techniques to know. They're really good ways to hear unconscious information. Mm -hmm. And so I, from even that early stage, I was trying to uh, get very specific about it. And then I realized over time, the problem was, is that really specific skills weren't being taught. And there wasn't really an emphasis on what works. It was like I had uh, teachers early on where they'd say, well, the question isn't whether the patient gets better, it's whether they have insight. And like, I was really quite troubled when I went to therapy at first. I had no interest in insight. I just wanted to feel better. And from a very early point, I thought, well, insight is cool, but it's worthless if, it, if a patient's not feeling better. I mean, people are suffering, right? We're in this to stop suffering. So to me, that seemed like a very immoral way to approach it. I mean, I don't know any patient's going to say, yeah, I don't care whether I get better, but yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to spend thousands of dollars to get an insight. You know, it just seemed, it just seemed like people had lost sight of why are we doing this? And I'm not claiming like, you know, ISTDB is the most successful therapy in the whole world. But to me, I thought, what really impressed me about the method is really getting very specific about what are the skills we're trying to teach and how do we, how do we measure effectiveness? And, and can we look at each session to see which interventions worked, which ones didn't, as a way to really begin to accelerate 
that. And I think, too, there was just this pride in craft, you know, growing up with my father in the blacksmith shop. I mean, if you had a weld that looked terrible, every, you know, dad would point it out. Everyone in the whole shop would see it. And so anyone who didn't really meet high standards, everybody saw your work. So it was really obvious. And if you did something beautiful, everybody would stand around and say, wow, that is beautiful, right? But there was this pride and craft. And and we would get stuff in. I still remember, you know, farmers would sometimes try to repair their own their own implements and it come in. And we look at some god awful thing that are broken. And my dad would look at the guy and say, uh, so did you weld this? And farmers say, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, but there there was a real pride in craft. And I realized like in psychotherapy, I mean, there what there we still I mean, just to give you an idea how primitive it is, we still have no agreement of, on what our basic skills therapists should have. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas like in blacksmithing, carpentry, those skills are really obvious and everyone looks and you see each other's work in our field. No one sees each other's work. I mean, for years, I wondered what actually happens in therapy. I mean, I had zillions of years of therapy myself, but I didn't really know what other people did in therapy. You know, it's crazy. It's like my wife is an oboist. One time she was taking a lesson with an oboe teacher, and a big part of playing the oboe is where you you have this reed and you have to scrape the reed, you know, that you put in your mouth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, she did it under the table so she couldn't see what he was doing. You know, that's how psychotherapy training is. You know, you have all these trainers. They're not showing video tapes of their, their work. So you have no idea what they do. And you know, have no way to look at it and say, did it work? If it did, why did it work? So in a way, you don't even have the basic things of craft. The other thing that was striking to me in music, in music, it's really clear on every instrument, what are the skills you need? We have these things called etude books, and they started getting written about 1750. Leopold Mozart wrote the first violin method, like 1750, mm-hmm. in Mozart's father, actually. And, um, and since that time, all throughout the 19th century, very important method books were written for all the instruments. And they're still the primary books uh, up till today. So any instrument you play, there's like a half dozen books you have to work through to, from the time you're a beginner to your professional player. So in a way, all these skill building exercises I'm developing, I view as like I'm developing the first etude books for for therapists. You know, not you know, I'm not saying I've, I certainly don't have all the skills out there yet, but I think trying to develop a systematic way of having these skills set up so people can have a practical way they can learn skills just like you would as a musician. You practice them enough times and through repetition, you can play a scale and you can play all your scales and you play them fluently and easily so you don't have to think about them. In a sense, we have all kinds of techniques we're needing to learn so that we're free in a way to make art, so to speak, um, as like, like musicians do. It's like my wife always thinks it's hilarious. She says, you know, when this uh, guy was saying, well, you know, you worry about technique. And my wife is saying, look, who would want to hear any musician if they didn't have technical mastery of their instrument? You know, no one can make great art that way. It's like, you know, it's like we would say, duh. (laughs) But in the psychotherapy field, there's really been a devaluation of, um, of skill, of technique, uh, believing that it's all the heart and all that, and instead of realizing there re- really has to be a melding of head and heart, of of technique and relatedness, so and, it, and you need both. I can imagine the breath of fresh air that was for you to meet the community, like ISTDP, where filming was a common practice. When it was revolutionary. Yeah, how was it, was it for you? Well, first of all, I have to tell you about. It. So I, for, I was just blown away first of all, to see work and work that was very effective. And I thought, wow, I want to be able to do that. The other thing that's funny is because I've been psychoanalytically trained. I thought, oh, my God, filming the work, you know, there's a violation of the patient's confidentiality. It's like there's another person in the room. There's like a third eye and so on and so forth. So when I first did the supervision where I had to show video of my work, I realized it was true. It was a violation of my confidentiality. Here I was, I was, what, 48 at the time or something like that. No one had actually seen my work before. Uh-huh. Think about that. You know, here I was, I've been doing therapy for about 18 years. No one had ever seen my work before. And it's like in music, 
everyone had heard my plan from day one. You know, it's like, you know, it's like often I was joke, you know, if, if, uh, if music stores were like the therapy profession, you'd have thousands of, of CDs in the store, but only f- five of them would be of actual concerts. The rest would be CDs of people talking about concerts, right? <laughs> you know, so so to me, it was it was just radical. Now it was very painful because it was very tough supervision because I was really having to learn. Wow, I'm really off base here, and it was so much more detail mm-hmm. than any supervision I'd had. But I mean, truly life changing for it me. Gave you what you wanted in a way. It gave me what well, gave me more. That I didn't even know I could want that much. <laughs> really, just uh-huh. had no idea, and it was really just fantastic uh-huh. and just having that kind of weekly super- and I mean I had 18 years of supervision every week up to that point and then I did you know seven more years of weekly supervision ice TDP plus other trainings and stuff on top of it and then you know and then over the course of that getting clear about going looking at deliberate practice how could I advance my work during the week you know it's like on my website you know I've got that article on self-supervision mm-hmm. I keep revising it because I keep finding new ways, right? Because if you got a videotape, how do you look at a videotape? How do you analyze your videotape? So maybe I should bridge here just for our listeners to understand. Yeah. You have a website called Deliberate Practice for Psychotherapists? Deliberate, uh, yeah, Deliberate Practice in, in Psychotherapy. psychotherapy. Exactly. Yep. And I wanted to ask you, what drew you, I think we already got the, the main idea, but still I wanted to ask you, what drew you to create this website? Well, I mean, I already have my website on ISDDP, but I realized that in terms of the skill building exercises, the skill building exercises I view as trans theoretical skill building exercises. Because let's face it, it really it really doesn't matter what kind of therapy you do. Everybody has to get find out what the problem is a patient wants to work on, and everybody has to regulate anxiety if it gets too high. Um, everybody has to deactivate projections that would prevent you from getting a therapeutic alliance, mm-hmm. right? Um, everyone has to deal with defenses that would create a patient from collaborating with you, right? And we call those, call those all kinds of different things, right? Uh, whether, whether you're doing CBT, DBT, um, focusing oriented therapy, whatever, but basically all of us are seeing the same patients, all of us. So all of us are having to need the same skills. Now, some will emphasize some skills over others, but the fact is, uh, they're all the same skills we have to be able to do. So I really view that side as really trans-theoretical. It's like, here's a bunch of skillable exercises. And, and our preliminary research is, is, showing, is showing that these skillable exercises do improve effectiveness. Um, we, have a, we, we did our first study where we did an uh, inpatient uh, drug rehab unit out in Arizona. It lasted only 10 weeks because funding fell apart, but in those 10 weeks, we had an ICDB unit and there was a drug rehab unit as usual. And uh, the therapist had three days, uh, kind of a boot camp of skill building with me. That's all we did. Here's like the most, like teaching them, here's the 20 most important skills you need with this population. And then each week they had group supervision with me for 10 weeks, and then they had Skill uh, an hour of skill building each week, and we had a series of skills we took them through. So we probably got through only about 30 skills with them. But um, what we saw is that usually in uh, in drug rehab, after a year, you know, only 15 percent of people out of rehab are still sober, and they have a dropout rate between 40 and 60 percent. It's very high. But in this rehab unit, even though 25 percent of our patients had psychotic symptoms, the uh, the um, the control group had a dropout rate of 40%. We had a dropout rate of 23%. Yeah. Um, uh, at six months, 17% of their patients were still sober. At ours, uh, six months, uh, 48% were still sober. The- so we were seeing a very dramatic change happening as a result of, uh, of you know, the format, but also skill building because we could see who had done the most skill building had the had the best results the person who had the who had done the less the least amount had the worst results it's actually very good publicity for deliberate practice what you're saying exactly and really in here in this case it, we weren't teaching every skill under the sun we we're mm-hmm. teaching those skills that you really need uh, with the drug addicts and we yeah. taught them in the order in which they're going to have to do those skills for that population but it's really looking specifically we have we have a, we have a 
another another study we do doing an outpatient uh, outpatient rehab group, and uh, we're at six months with that group, and and already we're seeing we had a twenty three percent dropout rate again, very small, and so we can't publish yet, but still right now a hundred percent of people are sober uh, that have completed the program. Now that course is going to fall over time. Don't get me wrong, but it does show the impact. I think not only the structure, but of what skill building does when it's really targeted to the specific issues you're going to deal with. Well, now, another po- another population you might have different skills that you'd have, but I think it does say something about what skills you need, what order. Well, let me share a personal uh, thing here because I have been doing for the last months the, some of the skills uh, package that you have uh, on sale on your website. Right. And I always feel like it's like going to the gym. Yeah. Because it, it really does feel like a, an effort emotionally, physically. You get tired. So you really feel that. Well, it's very interesting, too, because it, partly it's a cognitive thing. You're learning something, and you notice in some of the exercises they go a little longer, and that's to build your emotional endurance. Because, you know, patients, they, they produce these defenses automatically, so we have to be able to intervene as quickly as they produce them. So we actually have to improve our processing speed. And since your more disturbed patients will do this for a longer period of time, you have to have the endurance to do it for a longer period of time. Because it's like a, a musician, it's like, okay, you can play a scale, but you have to be able to play it at very different tempos. And uh, and they ha- and sometimes, you know, it's like right now, my wife is, uh, she'd had surgery this summer on her hand, right? So she's playing the oboe again, and she's going to go back to work next month. But she's having to play for longer periods of time each day because she's got to be able to play six hours a day starting in uh, January, uh-huh. you know? And so same thing with us, we have to have the, you know, if you can manage to keep addressing defenses for only 10 minutes, you still got the other 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I am tempted to ask you for your definition of psychotherapy expertise. What do you think is an expert in psychotherapy? Hmm, that's really interesting. I think it involves a certain union of head and heart. And I think it's an understanding that techniques are not something you do to the patient. They're ways of relating to the patient. So it's a deeper understanding that it's ways of relating to the patient. And an understanding that there's no way of working that works with all patients. That that we tend to think of a model like a ritual that we apply to people, but there's no ritual that works with everyone. So in a way, you have to have a very flexible way of thinking that's going to allow you to use certain principles that will be applied in very different ways across the spectrum. Some people who see a case of mine will say, oh, that's what John does. And then when they see four or five cases, they start to get confused. Well, in this case, you did that, or this one, you did that, right? And I think the the big problem in our field is that we have a tremendous yearning for ritualism as a defense against uh, thinking and engaging in complexity. Mm -hmm. And that requires us to really have a, a, a very big sky kind of mind. And I think the other aspect of being an expert, the only way you can be an expert, really, is studying your videotape and being open to feedback. That that There has to be some process of ongoing self-assessment, and you have to have colleagues you can turn to who will look at your videotape with you. I have colleagues I turn to, right, who look at my videotape. If I'm stuck, look at this, let me know. You know, I spend time every week looking at at least an hour a week, if not more, looking at my uh, at my videos to see where am I off, what's happening. Um, so, in a sense, a lot of times we think, okay, someone is just a master, right? But the, the, as soon as someone thinks they have the answer, it's like I always tell my supervisees, the point when I think I have the answers, just tell me it's time to retire. <laughs> Right, because that's a form of death. I mean, you know, I'm I'm good. I keep getting better. I still don't succeed 100% of the time. So I'm still 
looking at my work week after week. I'm still finding flaws, a case where I made a mistake. Okay, let me look at that. See why am I making a mistake? What's the pattern of that mistake? What where what were the points where I got off? Yeah. Right. In other words, that there's always a learning curve, always a play, a lot of places where we could still get better. And that involves not just technique, but especially at more advanced ages, essentially a lot of emotional growth. You know, as you know, working with Tony, a lot of his focus is like, what are the emotions getting stirred up in you that are inhibiting you from using what, what you know? Yeah. I tend, in my skill building exercises, I work more to make sure, do you have those skills? But once people have those skills, then we're at the next level of supervision is to finding out, okay, now you have the skills, what are the emotional issues that are preventing you from using them? Yeah. Uh -huh. And as near as I can tell, sad to say, this seems to be a lifelong learning journey. <laughs> I mean, I, early on as a therapist, you know, I had supervisors that talked about how they've been analyzed, you know, it's just like it gave a sense that they'd somehow been psychologically purified. And that 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 obviously did not occur here. So, <laughs> you know, so it's very interesting to realize. Um, and I keep saying this to supervisees. No, I, I still I still get caught in countertransference things. I still get hooked. Right. And, and that there's this constant kind of um, internal growing, internal learning um, that's uh, that's that's lifelong. And that seems also to be a common factor in experts, this content continuous striving to learn more to know more uh -huh. well and, and also understanding and not only they're striving but understanding that we never have the answers that we're always learning we're always coming yeah. to know you know i think one of the big problems is uh is is it's the as beyond talked about one of the most difficult things is tolerating that we don't have answers at mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. You know, and can we tolerate not knowing rather than fill it in with our favorite theory? Yeah, how you it know? should be. <laughs> yeah, how it should be or what I know, you know, because if you have a theory of how it should be or how you understand it, yeah, you can manipulate the session so it will sort of look like your yeah. theory. But anyone watching from the outside will see, wow, this is really interesting <laughs> example of uh, manipulation. Well, let me quote you. You were mentioning an article you have on your website of, on self-supervision. And you write there that we make mistakes because we can't assess the patient's responses. Forget mm -hmm. about your own interventions. If you focus on them too much, you'll probably just judge yourself and be afraid to look at the tape. Could yep. you elaborate on this a little? Yeah, because I think, you know, the problem is when we look at our work, oftentimes we engage in self-attack as a substitute for clinical thinking. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually don't learn too much from our mistakes. I mean, we learn a little bit from our mistakes. We can see a pattern. But then what we have to do is we have to look at, because the mistake is actually the result of a failure of assessment. Like we didn't understand the patient's response. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is like when we're making a particular mistake, start looking at the patient response and figure out, okay, what is the patient's response telling us about what the next thing is to do. Because in a sense, every patient, this our model is based on response intervention. Okay, it worked, great, I should keep doing it. It didn't work. Okay, <laughs> so, all right, let's see from their response, because their response will tell us consciously or unconsciously where we should be going. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we're having to improve our ability to assess the patient's response. Yeah. So that's where you need to pay attention to that. Now, sometimes it, therapists engage in way too much self-attack and they can't actually watch their videotapes because they get too depressed. So for them, I ask them to just watch their tape with the sound off. Whoa. Yeah, I, ask, I have them watch it with the sound off. And as, they're, and as they're listening, whenever they see the patient take a sigh, stop the tape, run it back 10 seconds, and write down whatever their intervention was. Mm. Because their intervention just triggered anxiety, and that means it's the right thing to do. And I, as I say to students, you're always doing at least five or 10 minimum good things in a session. And then, and then I have them turn the sound off and wait until the next side. Stop, run the tape back 10 seconds, write down what that intervention was. And then that way, th once you have those 10 interventions, just do more of that next time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so that's a really nice way to see what are you doing right. Uh huh. So you know, 
The, another thing I have students do is if they're not quite so self-critical, is that as soon as they hear themselves making a mistake, I have them watch the tape, but then I have them say the right thing over the tape. Uh -huh. so, so that's teaching them to do the right thing rather than to listen to their mistake. Yeah, it's almost like an, a corrective experience in a way. Yes, right. And all supervision should be a corrective experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like once they see a mistake, fine. As a supervisor, you don't need to repeat it now. And, and so the problem is the supervisor can keep repeating it and making a supervisor, supervisee depressed, or the supervisee gets hyper-focused on the mistake. And so you have to block it. Yeah, we know that. Uh -huh. But how would you respond now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I know that. But how would you respond now? Uh -huh. and, and now, how would you respond? <laughs> so as a supervisor, you can block a self-attack. Uh -huh. You know, as a way, you know, because in a way, when you, we have to be very responsive to self-esteem and supervision, because now the, yeah. when the supervisee didn't see their video, they could think, okay, it was pretty good. When they start to see more mistakes, that can be super ego food, right? It's like feeding this. <laughs> super ego food is very good. Yeah. yeah. And so we don't want to feed the super ego. It's already eating way too much already. <laughs> <laughs> So we have to kind of block uh, block that and, and in a way kind of protect the supervisee from that. It's like I had a supervisee just the other day saying, oh, my God, I look at my tape. I think this is so bad. I just feel like I'm lagging behind the group. I can't even face the group. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I had to say, um, I said, uh, I, said I, I don't think you're lagging behind the group, but you may be lagging behind the fantasy you had of how you wanted to be right now. Mm -hmm. And that's quite normal. I am always lagging behind the fantasy of how I would like to be. <laughs> <laughs> Reality is here to destroy them. Yes, you're right. I'm always very successfully lagging behind my fantasy <laughs> every day. That's very few things I can guarantee, but I can always guarantee that I'm lagging behind my fantasy. <laughs> so there's different ways we have to help help supervisees when they're being supervised with VDA tape so that they can't misuse their tape or supervision uh, for the purpose of, of, of self-attack. Well, this makes, I think, a very nice bridge to something I want to ask you. I think it was in 2013 that your co-creating change book was out and yep. it went on to win the first prize in psychiatry by the British yep. Medical Association. Congratulations. Thank I you. think it's an absolute powerhouse of a book. I've had so much fun digging into it. And one thing that came up for me is that you have so many decision trees there. It's so clear. like, yep. And it, it almost brings in the fantasy that you could pinpoint any intervention for any situation. And mm -hmm. I was wondering that while this is happening, you also write a lot about how people are a mystery. I yep. think you were even kind of inspired by Boober sometimes in this regard. Oh, absolutely. So how are you how do you reconcile this idea that people are mysteries but you have a wish to create very clear guidelines for intervention? Because I think there's always this inherent antinomy between the uh, uh, between the known and the unknown. Right? The the known is nested in the unknown. Mhm. Mm or in, in philosophical terms, you would say that epistemology is always nested in ontology, mm -hmm. right? What we know, how we know, is rested in, in the nature of being, Yeah. right? So there's always this antinomy, in a sense, that, in other words, this opposition that where two elements require each other, epistemology and ontology, like, just like the known requires the unknown. So yes, there are very clear decision trees, and there's a lot we can know, but there's always this sense that no matter how much we know, um, the patient themselves, their potential, their future, their depths, just in a way Freud talked about this, there's what we're conscious of, but it's rested in what we're unconscious of. Yeah. And, and, and what we're unaware of is always much larger than this little bit we're aware of. Yeah. And so t t it, it takes a lot of um, tolerance of complexity to tolerate this antinomy of the unknown and the un and the unknown. In, in the simplest way, is like I've known my wife uh, for forty one years now, and uh, yeah, I don't know what the next thing is she's going to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I love my wife, but she, you know, yes, I, I know her very deeply. I know her more deeply than anyone, and yet that knowledge also rests 
in, in the unknown. Mm -hmm. and, and what we see so many times is where people, uh, therapists are hoping to be epistemological conquistadors, <laughs> that they'll know everything. <laughs> And in a sense, we there's this incredible urge to know as much as we can, but it always has to be nested in the reality that we'll never know at all. So and we have to tolerate uh, both of these things at the same time. And you would agree that theory by itself can be used as a way to intellectualize about patients? Absolutely. I mean, theory is great. It's just like if I'm going somewhere, I'm really glad I have a map, mm -hmm. right? But the map, theory is never the same as the territory, sure. reality. <laughs> so when we can't tolerate that reality is always much bigger than our map, we'll idealize a map. So you have people who idealize CBT or DBT or psychoanalysis. I mean, every therapy model gets idealized by some people who, who want to ritualize and, and, and idealize some theory and say that captures everything, right? But then we've moved into ritualism. Yeah. And so that's, I think, one of the big challenges we face. It doesn't matter what model of therapy you're dealing with. We're all struggling with. Can we accept that our, our theory is just a finger pointing at reality? <laughs> And if we can't tolerate that, yeah, we can, we can misuse any theory for the purpose of um, making stuff up about people. Yeah. Well, studying your own style and paying attention to the excerpts, you do a lot of, uh, you write a lot of excerpts of your own interventions in your books. And I really appreciate how concise you are. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if this is just part of your personal style or if it's an actual skill that you also train to develop. Oh, gosh, I had to train for that. <laughs> I, had been, I had been trained psychoanalytically, uh -huh. and so I had gotten used to the, just intellectualizing my butt off. Pardon <laughs> my vernacular. It was terrible. And, um, and actually, there was a famous psychoanalyst who talked about this. The psychoanalyst Winnicott said, you know, you should keep your comments brief and to the point. Moreover, if you use the word moreover, You've talked too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But, but I think, yes, I try to be very concise because we forget, we've, we've learned all these interventions and thoughts and ideas and principles in books that we've studied. But patients are hearing these things for the first time. It's, it's a surprise to them. So since we're saying something for the first time to them, um, that it should be very short and very easily understandable so that they could understand what you're saying. And, and to realize that you don't give them the whole book, you give them a sentence at a time. And as they understand each sentence, then it's like you're building something, you know, brick by brick by brick over time mm -hmm. instead of overwhelming them. And, and that you're checking in, do they, do they understand this? So, you know, it's just, I was just seeing someone the other day And she'd, met, she'd been very depressed, and she's quite isolated, and so on and so forth. And after we're in, in the session, about 15 minutes, um, she, uh, she started to look at the ceiling. And I said, I notice you're looking at the ceiling right now. Do you notice that, too? And she said, yeah, yeah, it's just easier to think. I said, exactly. It's easier for you to think when you're not in contact with me. And I'm just thinking when you look away, it breaks contact with me. And that would be one of the things that could make you lonely. And her eyes teared up. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not saying this to find fault with you. You came here. You want to know. You know you're doing something that's making you lonely. It's obviously happening outside your awareness. Right? And she says, right. So do I have your permission to kind of point out anything I'm noticing? That, that could make you lonely in your relationships. Yeah, yeah. Right? So sentence by sentence by sentence, just making sure there's an understanding as we do something that's very weird. No one has pointed out that she looks all over the place, and that could be a reason why she's 40 years, uh, 40 years old and not married, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, yeah. Well, it's, it's, the, it's interesting because as you were speaking, I was also remembering your artistic background and thinking, I, I, I think part of why I appreciate it, I also appreciate a lot this clearness and this conciseness, but aesthetically, it's also very nice, I think. It's very beautiful mm -hmm. to be able to just concisely uh, share what it, whatever it is you want to share. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, 
so that it's easily understandable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Well, in your latest book, The Lies We Tell Ourselves, mm -hmm. you, you mention a very, I, I uh, had a lot of fun reading it, and you mentioned a term that you call psychosyrupy or pseudo empathy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a lie that therapists might fall prey to, I imagine, from your point of view. Oh, I fell into it. Yeah. Can you distinguish between what is for you psychosyrupy and what is genuine, clinically relevant empathy? Right. Well, as I mentioned in the book, I actually, I didn't coin it myself. It came from a colleague of mine at NIH. His name was uh, Morris Parloff. Mm -hmm. He was uh, one of the great teachers at the Washington School of Psychiatry. And, and what he, he called psychosyrupy is, let's suppose that a guy has a... Uh, uh, Yells, yells at his wife and calls her a bitch, and then she hangs up on the phone, and then he comes home, uh, comes to the therapist's office and complains about how his wife is such a bitch because he'd yell at her, called her a bitch, and she hung up on the phone, and where the therapist says, oh, that's really too bad. Oh, that's such a shame. That must have been very painful for you when she hung up so for that, and can we take a look at, at this painful feeling in you, right? Instead of, uh, instead of pointing out to the guy that he'd called her a bitch and wondering why he would want to do something like that would be that would be guaranteed to kill off the love uh, that he so much craves uh, from his wife mm -hmm. so in a way it's um yeah he called it pseudo uh, psychosyrupy another of my supervisors early on an analyst brilliant harold ice called it a uh, uh, pseudo empathy uh -huh. Because in a sense, you're empathizing with a patient's very self-destructive defense, uh -huh. right? Rather than empathizing with the man who is at risk of destroying his marriage. Yeah. So, right. So, yeah, go ahead. No, I was thinking because I do know that ISTDP has been portrayed, I think, by their sister experiential uh, approaches, as more active and even maybe more confrontational And I had yeah. already the, the chance to talk with Patricia Coughlin, and she was great at pointing out that, you know, we're not confronting the person, we're confronting what we see that's destroying the person. But it does seem like a, a, another skill to develop a lot. Right. And I think, you know, um, you know, people think it's aggressive, right? Well, aggression actually comes from the Latin, mm. to step forward. Ad gratis. Uh -huh. And so, in a sense, since defenses are creating the patients presenting problems and suffering, uh -huh. then in a sense, uh, uh, pointing out a defense that hurts a patient is really the most compassionate thing we could do. Uh -huh. In a sense, you could think that the patient is suffering as if there's some person beating them up and they can't see that person. Mm -hmm. And we're coming in to kind of help them see when that person hits them, yeah. when that person yells at them, when that person devalues them, when that person um, verbally abuses them, right? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, defense identification and clarifying the price is really the most empathic thing we could do because in a way we have to help the patient see these defenses so they can defend themselves against these defenses. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The so-called defenses that were defenses early on are modern-day attackers. Yeah. So we have to have the patients see the attackers to, so that they can defend themselves against these unconscious attacking mechanisms that are hurting them. Yeah. And, and in terms of confrontation, actually, we don't use any confrontation with about 80% of patients. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you have fragile patients, when they have a little bit of feeling, they can't tolerate inside. So they'll project feelings onto you and think, oh, Alexander, you're, uh, you're angry, right? Uh -huh. so you, you need to be very careful with fragile patients that you're not triggering too much feeling because if they feel too much, they have to project a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's no challenge that you do with that group. Uh -huh. And the same, so you never confront defenses with fragile patients. And likewise, with patients who are really depressed, they go to self-attack. If you challenge their defenses, it causes sharp rise of feeling. What, where do their feelings go when, they, uh, when they're with you? Back on them, and they'll become more self-attacking, more depressed. Yeah. So actually, with 80% of our patients, there's virtually no confrontation at all. Yeah. Now, with 20% of patients, there's this group where they really resist, uh, you know, they really put up a wall, 
and we have to help them see the wall they put up, yeah. and we have to help them see the price of the wall, and then we'll say, so what can we do about this wall we're seeing here, right? Mm -hmm. so, and that's what we would call challenging the resistance, is what can we do about that? Yeah. But we can't even do that until they can see the wall and until they can uh, see the price of the wall, and that they can see that we know this is not you, but it is a way that you hide from people. So what do you think we can do about this strategy you have of hiding? Yeah. So there's only 20% of people we do any confrontation, and we'd only confront the resistance when they can see it, when they can see the price, and when they can see that it's not them, but it's a strategy they use for avoiding closeness with people. Yeah. I was wondering because I just something sparked up while you were talking because you have uh, I imagine that you now have tapes of yourself doing therapy for decades now. Yeah, <laughs> which is a, an incredible rich repertoire. You can go back and actually see yourself doing therapy a long time yeah. ago. Like I yeah. think your first book was 1996 or 1999. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So I learned quite a bit about reflection from a psychodynamic perspective from that book. Yes. And I'm I, now I was wondering, how do you think you would compare your, your, own, your clinical practice now from like that time, from 20 years ago? If we were to watch the tapes, is, what do you think would be striking as a development? Well, in, in fact, I have no tapes uh, prior to the time I did ISTDP. Mm -hmm. So, and, 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 and honestly, most of, the, most of the tapes early on when I was doing ISTDP, I erased them all. They were just so painful <laughs> to watch. <laughs> <laughs> It must be tempting a lot of times. Oh, oh. You know, because, you know, I still remember, like, I would be looking at these videos, right? And so I would, I would do a transcription. And then, I'd, and then I'd look at my interventions and I say, okay, was I exploring feeling? Was I regular anxiety? Was I addressing defense and returning feeling? Or was I cognizing? Okay, so what was my most common intervention? Yes. Of course. Cognizing. So I realized, oh my, I mean, I, and I numerically figured out what the percentage was. I thought, well, no wonder this case is stuck. I'm just intellectualizing here, right? The patient doesn't even have to intellectualize. I'm Doing providing for him. for him. Yay, John. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Go for it. So it's like, wow, if I could just stop providing this patient more defenses, this case might move, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. That was, it was very, honestly, it was painful for me to just see, oh, But, you know, just how much I was in. And I, you know, in my case, I was older. So I have really had to unlearn old habits. You're lucky you're early on. So, you <laughs> have so many old habits unlearned. But I was like an old dog having to learn new tricks. And uh -huh. oh, painful. And, you know, here I'd written this book and I was very, very respected. And it's like now I'm having to take my work to this whole new level. Yeah. And I'm learning these things I hadn't known. I hadn't seen. I'm seeing things I hadn't seen. It was just like. Whoa, that was painful. I thought I was kind of an expert. And it's like, you know what? My work is now having to move up to a whole uh -huh. different level. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you already spoke about this importance of dealing with yourself and with your own life as a therapist. Yeah. I, I remember, at least I've read two papers of yours on countertransference. There's a 1991 on uh, um, countertransference as an empathic position. And yep. there's a more recent one, countertransference in supervision. Yep. And now I was thinking, well, what do you want to say about the therapist's own work in their own experiential self as a necessary condition to be an expert? Well, I think um, it's interesting with the issue of countertransference. I, um, ordinarily, I don't focus on countertransference a lot with beginning therapists because the reason they're making mistakes is usually uh, just because they don't know what to do. Yeah. So in the beginning of supervision for me with most supervisees, I'm just doing a lot of teaching so they know what to do. Um, now, when they have tr once they know what to do, they have trouble doing it, then I start shifting to their countertransference. Um, if they're working with uh, borderline patients or psychotic patients, then I have to work with uh, countertransference a lot with them right away because that's oftentimes the primary way that patients are communicating to the therapist. And uh, beginning therapists are usually drowning in the countertransference, so they need some help to get them out of it. So, like, uh, so, like, if this, pa you know, a, a supervisor comes in, oh, this patient thinks I'm terrible, nothing I do is any good, thinks my work is totally crap, 
And I might say, wow, it sounds like that patient is really having a deep insight about you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they'll start, they'll start laughing. Right. Uh -huh. And, and then I can help kind of pop them out of that counter-transference drowning so that then we can help them begin to think about that experience and what that experience means, how we can use that experience. Yeah. So in a way, I had sometimes develop a capacity for self-reflective functioning so they can observe experience and think about and reflect on it. And, and that can take a while to develop with, with different people and also with the severity of illness uh, yeah. of the patient. And I do remember reading Alan Abbas, one of your ISTDP colleagues, writing yeah. that a good portion of his trainees to this approach really did take a heavy punch. Like, it's not an easy approach to learn this specific. Well, you know, honestly, to learn any kind of therapy really well, it's not easy. I mean, if you look like at the work of Freeman and CBT, that guy is an expert. I mm -hmm. mean, that, that's not something, you know, a lot of times pe people think CBD is very simple. And the way a lot of people do it is simplistic. But you look at Freeman's work, that there's You mean a Arthur real Freeman? Yeah, mm -hmm. he's superb. Or you look at, um, or, or to be really expert, like Otto Kernberg, I mean, that's not going to just happen in a couple of years. Sure. So, you know, as a psychoanalyst or ISTDP, but I think truly to become a master mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in these models, you know, it really, uh, it really takes a lot of time, effort and study of videotape. And that's, and that's, you know, the recent research by Wampold, you know, as they're looking at expert practitioners, they're saying the expert practitioners are really looking at videotapes of their own work. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what the, and they're practicing specific skills they need uh, where they are in their work. Yeah, and we're back to the deliberate practice and super shrink literature. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because, I mean, honestly, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I could see like last week I had a couple new cases and I could see my work was, was much better uh, than, than, than the last consultation I had with that type of case like a month ago. You know, as I could just see. <laughs> You know, because of some work I've been doing, I could really see how the work was really at a whole new level. And it's just like, yeah, it's just, but you have to just keep working at it. There's always an edge. Yeah. So, and I'm, and I'm sure there are people who are much better therapists than me. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> That's why I keep, keep working at this, right? Sure. Deliberately practicing. Exactly. Because, I mean, you know, like Scott Miller is saying, like, the very best super strengths he's meeting are succeeding, like, about 70% of the time. I mean, like... We, we have a lot of room for improvement. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to make a little thought experiment with you. If yeah. you went into therapy yourself now, how would you describe your ideal therapist? Oh, my ideal therapist? Yeah. Um, someone, who's, someone who's warm, very honest, and who will not hesitate to say what needs to be said. Mm-hmm. But we'll say it from a position, uh, not of judgment, but of recognizing this is what I would need to hear in, in order to get better. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah. Because, you know, the other thing there's, that Wampold's research is showing is that the very best therapists, their work looks surprisingly similar. Mm. And, and I think a lot of it is because they're not taking a lot of these patient patterns personally. Mm -hmm. They're really able to observe these um, and they're able to describe them without judgment. They're able to be honest. They're able to kind of titrate according to what they think the patient can manage. Mm -hmm. But they're being, you know, they're kind of taking the patient to the edge of what their capacity could be in this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't want someone holding back on me uh, rather than testing out, you uh -huh. know, what I could do. Yeah. Well, you have been very active recently on the technology piece. You've co-authored some articles on this, on supervision uh, and training through um, through Skype, I guess. Through yep, yeah. And uh, you you have a Facebook page now where you answer yep. people's comments. How do you think technology in general can lead us, can help us towards psychotherapy expertise in the future? How will it be a game changer? Um, I think there's a couple of things. One is that um. I mean, I think that, like, for instance, the skill building exercises are really good so that we can really teach people this kind of language, like you do language tapes. And I think that that, that will, will hopefully become the norm in psychotherapy training. 
Because like in my in like my training groups, people have to master certain skills. Like every time we meet, there's certain skills they have to master before the next time we meet. Mm -hmm. So there's like you know it's like a, a, a form of com a objective form of competency measurement. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, another thing that I'm working on with Alan and with uh, Alan Kalpin is uh, we're in the process of developing uh, a prototype where there's an avatar where you would be interacting with an avatar on a video. It would be saying certain things, and you'd have to decide how to intervene. Okay. And uh, and uh, I, you know, we've been looking at different different ways. It's still too expensive to do everything we want to do, but at least we're working with a prototype because then you could, instead of like, instead of just learning on patients, it'd be much better if we could have people learning on avatars. Yeah. Yeah. There's only a certain amount of uh, role. Like I do a lot of role playing with my supervisees, where I'll role play a patient or they role play the patient, whatever. But but since this, since we're seeing that patients really do operate according to certain implicit unconscious decision trees, that we can we can use this as as the basis of kind of an ad of uh, a training using using an avatar where there's implicit decision trees that will go certain ways. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's like in chess. You know, like the, the skill of uh, ch in chess playing has exploded over the last 30 years, and it's because they figured out how to, do, how to train people uh, through chess programs mm -hmm. that will measure your e and, uh, and so then you can just work with a computer, and it will adjust itself to your skill level, and then it'll, it'll uh, take you up. And my hope is, over time, we just uh, – they were able to do that with chess, but we're just needing to get the kind of funding – where we could do that in psychotherapy because we could, we, you know, I have these decision trees uh -huh. and we just have diff different ones for like fragile patients, mild, moderate, severe fragility, mm -hmm. repression, uh, um, moderate resistance, isolation of affect, high resistance, isolation of affect, character resistance. So you've got like, you know, the six major types say, and then, and then you just have this different, this, this different decision trees and these atabars uh, where they just uh, take you through that. So that's that's really my big hope is then then people could practice with these things and they do it enough where they're where it gets familiar and then they themselves understand uh, uh, understand these patterns that I think uh, could lead to really quite a big um, rise in therapist skill. So I think another thing I think another thing we can do in therapy is you know like right now. Like on average, uh, therapy is helping about 50% of people and about 50% of them are dropping out. But what we're seeing is that the, a large, very large percentage of the, of the best results in therapy are happening with the top 20%. And a lot of really bad results are happening at the bottom 20%. And something Tony and I had talked about, we, uh, we wanted to work with some group where they're doing, uh, where they're doing outcome follow-up. And where we would work with the bottom 20% of therapists. Because our thought is, you know, we probably could increase the, the overall outcome of therapy dramatically if we worked with the worst therapists. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were eliminating the worst effects, because like 10% of patients are getting worse in therapy. Yeah. But if we eliminate the, you know, if we could find a clinic where they're already doing outcome research and we could work with their bottom 10%, mm -hmm. or 20% of therapists and just do a skill building uh, uh, program with them over the course of six months or, or a year, um, I think it'd just be really fascinating to see what effect um, that would have on their effectiveness. Yeah, this sounds really important what you're saying because it's very easy to get uh, very uh, excited about studying super strings and empowering your effectiveness, but there are those 10% and those negative effects. And yep. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that brings down the overall effectiveness of the whole, sure. right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. It's it's sort of like uh, uh, like we're we're going to do a study out and use in the department of psychiatry. We haven't gotten all approved yet, but it's in progress. And one thing that's very interesting in the medical field, they they do this sort of thing because they find that in July in the United States, mortality increases for a couple of months on hospital units because that's when the new in, uh, interns come in. Mm. And the problem is the new interns don't have basic skills they need, and so patients are dying as a result. Mm. So certain medical specialties, they've introduced the idea of like a boot camp where all the interns have a three-day weekend, and they have to learn like the six or ten most important skills in simulation-based training. Mm -hmm. And they all have to master those skills before they go in the hospital unit the next week. And as a result, mortality really dropped. Yeah. 
<laughs> right. And, and, and we have that in our field, too, is that if we were able to do that with the bottom 20 percent of patients or therapists who are accounting for probably a majority of the bad results, that could be a huge boon to the psychotherapy field. To drop our mortality rate. <laughs> to drop our mortality rate. Exactly. Because the, the thing is, is that uh, there's really no limit on the number of people that are coming in. And, and oftentimes people are coming into our field who, frankly, shouldn't be getting in. And music, like if you're just not good enough, you won't get hired. It's just so competitive. Yeah. But there's really almost no competition to become a therapist, really pretty much anybody can become a therapist with yeah. people, and we, we know that. So the question is how, what could we do with that bottom 20%? I think that, that would be an interesting study. We haven't found a clinic that would do that with us, but I'm super. I certainly excited. hope you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, so too. one last thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, I think it's tying up a, a lot of what we've been speaking about. I was curious to ask you something that I've asked all of, my psychotherapy heroes, all of the colleagues yeah. I've interviewed, which yeah. is what piece of advice would you wish to have received when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? What do I wish I'd received? Yeah. What piece of advice would you wish to have received? I wish somebody had said, start videotaping your cases and start analyzing, uh, transcribing and analyzing a case each week and analyze every intervention, ask yourself, were you uh, exploring feeling, were you regulating anxiety, were you pointing at a defense, or were you cognizing? Do that analysis each week and see if you can increase the frequency in which you're exploring a feeling and decrease the frequency with which you're intellectualizing. I wish someone had just given me that, <laughs> that basic advice. I mean, I, I mean, of course, you should get supervision on a weekly basis. I take that as a given. Right. You should get really, really good supervision. But since we know that 93% of supervision is inadequate from Ellis's study, um, then you really need to be looking at what you can do for self-supervision. And for that, videotape. Uh, just videotaping your work, just that. Even if you don't look at the videotape, your effectiveness is going to go up. Yeah. That's what the research shows. Totally weird. <laughs> so that's the one nugget of wisdom we could leave our listeners today with. Yeah. yeah. Get really good supervision, but videotape your work and, and do this kind of analysis, uh, transcribe a, a session each week and analyze it. Yep. Yeah. That will really, that will really supercharge your progress. Okay. John, I had so much fun. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.